Our country, over 60% of our people are living paycheck to paycheck, and millions are working for starvation wages. Unbelievably, despite an explosion in technology and huge increases in worker productivity, the average American worker is making $50 a week less than he or she made 50 years ago after adjusting for inflation. Unless we change the nature of the way our economy works, it is all too likely that our younger generation will have a lower standard of living than their parents. What this means in reality is that workers throughout our country are struggling to pay for housing, struggling to pay for health care and prescription drugs, struggling to put food on the table, struggling to pay off their student debts and to deal with other basic necessities of life. And while that is the reality for the working class of this country, here is another reality, and that is that the people on top have never, ever had it so good. Today in America, we have more income and wealth inequality than we have ever had, with the top 1% now owning more wealth than the bottom 90%, with CEOs now making 400 times what their workers are making, and with three people at the top owning more wealth than the bottom half of American society. That is the economic reality that exists today. People on top doing extraordinarily well. Millions of working families struggling. And as a result of that economic reality, what we are now seeing is a major increase in trade union organizing. Throughout our country, in blue-collar jobs and in white-collar jobs, Workers are standing up, and they are fighting back to form unions in order to improve their wages, their benefits, and their working conditions. These workers know, as I do, that union workers earn 20 percent more on average than non-union workers. These workers also know, as I do, that union workers have better health care benefits better paid family and medical leave policies, are much more likely to have a pension, and are less likely to be victims of health and safety violations compared to non-union workers. At a time when 71 percent of the American people now approve of unions, the highest level since 1965, there has been a major revitalization of the trade union movement in this country. Between 2021 and 2022, the number of union, union elections taking place in America has gone up by 53 percent. And since 2020, workers have voted to form a union in over 70 percent of union elections. Rather extraordinary. And now that is the good news for those of us who understand that strong unions are a vital part of rebuilding the declining middle class in this country. That's the good news. The bad news is that in order to combat this increase in union organizing, corporations have engaged in an unprecedented level of illegal union busting activities, which takes us to the focus of today's hearing. Over the past 18 months, Starbucks has waged the most aggressive and illegal union-busting campaign in the modern history of our country. That union-busting campaign has been led by Howard Schultz, the multi-billionaire founder and director of Starbucks, who is with us this morning only under the threat of subpoena. Let us be clear about the nature 
of Starbucks' vicious anti-union efforts. The National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, has filed over 80 complaints against Starbucks for violating federal labor law. There have been over 500 unfair labor practice, practice charges lodged against the company, and judges have found that Starbucks broke the law 130 times across six states since workers began organizing in the fall of 2021. These violations include the illegal firing of more than a dozen Starbucks workers for the crime of exercising their right to form a union and to collectively bargain for better wages, benefits, and working conditions. Since the first Starbucks union was certified more than 450 days ago in Buffalo, workers at more than 360 stores across 40 states have held union elections. 83% of these elections have resulted in a union victory, and today nearly 300 Starbucks coffee shops employing more than 7,000 workers have a union, despite Starbucks' aggressive anti-union efforts. But with nearly 300 shops voting to form a union, Starbucks has refused to sign a single first contract with the union, not a single one. Think about that. Think about a multi-billion dollar company with unlimited resources, with all kinds of lawyers, advisors, consultants, and yet they have not yet signed one contract with any of their nearly 300 unionized shops. Just a few weeks ago, on March 1st, an administrative law judge found Starbucks guilty of, quote, egregious and widespread misconduct, end quote, which showed, quote, a general disregard for the employee's fundamental rights, end quote. In a 220-page ruling, this judge found that Starbucks illegally retaliated against employees for unionizing, promised improved pay and benefits if workers rejected the union, conducted illegal surveillance of pro-union workers, refused to hire prospective employees who supported the union, relocated union organizers to new stores, and overstaffed stores ahead of union votes. All clear violations of federal labor law. The judge also found that Starbucks, quote, widespread coercive behavior over six months had permeated every store in the Buffalo market, end quote. The judge ordered Starbucks to reinstate seven workers who were wrongfully terminated, reopen a pro-union store in Buffalo that was illegally shut down, and pay, quote, reasonable consequential damages, end quote, to more than two dozen Starbucks workers whose rights were violated by the company. And let us be clear, Starbucks' egregious union-busting campaign is not limited to Buffalo. It is happening all over America. Federal courts in Tennessee and Michigan have issued emergency injunctions requiring Starbucks to reinstate workers who were illegally fired and to prohibit the coffee chain from firing workers for supporting unionization efforts in the future. In Scottsdale and Phoenix, Arizona, the NLRB has charged Starbucks with committing eight violations of labor law when it disciplined, fired, and forced out workers because they cooperated with federal investigations. On November 30th of last year, the NLRB found that Starbucks unlawfully refused to recognize and bargain with the union at its reserve roastery store in Seattle. NLRB judges have found that Starbucks illegally threatened to withhold benefits, including health insurance, from pro-union workers in Denver, Overland Park, Kansas, Seattle, Washington, and Ann Arbor, Michigan. The pattern in all of these stores is clear. On one hand, we have workers making 13, 14, 15 dollars an hour with minimal benefits, working 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week, maybe 40 hours a week, depending on a totally unpredictable schedule dictated by their managers. 
And these workers are out there struggling today to achieve dignity and justice on the job. That's what they are trying to do, and I applaud their efforts. And on the other hand, we have a corporation worth some $113 billion, largely controlled by an individual worth some $4 billion, who are using their unlimited resources to do everything possible, legal and illegal, to deny these workers their constitutional right to form a union. The fundamental issue we are confronting today is whether we have a system of justice that applies to all, or whether billionaires and large corporations can break the law with impunity. I have read Mr. Schultz's comments to the media in which he expresses his strong anti-union views. As an American, Mr. Schultz is entitled to those views and any other views he holds. But even if he is a multi-billionaire and the head of a giant corporation, he is not entitled to break the law. So today, I will be asking Mr. Schultz whether he will do what an administrative judge, law judge has ordered him to do, and that is to record and distribute a 14-page notice which states that Starbucks has violated federal labor law to inform Starbucks employees all across this country about their rights under the National Labor Relations Act, how Starbucks has violated those rights, and to assure that Starbucks will not infringe upon those rights in the future. In other words, I will be asking Mr. Schultz whether or not he intends to obey the law. Further, I will be asking Mr. Schultz another question, and that is whether or not he is prepared to promise this committee that within 14 days of this hearing, Starbucks will exchange proposals with the union, something that it has refused to do for more than 450 days, so that meaningful progress can be made to bargain a first contract in good faith. And let me conclude by saying that what is outrageous to me is not only Starbucks' anti-union activities and their willingness to break the law. It is their calculated and intentional efforts to stall, to stall, and to stall. They understand that the turnover rate at Starbucks and many other similar type companies is high. They understand that if workers see, do not see success in gaining a contract, they are going to get discouraged and give up the fight. At a time when we want, in this difficult time in our country, for people to stand up and fight for their rights, to try to destroy the spirit of thousands and thousands of people who are fighting for justice, that, to my mind, is unforgivable. Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Chairman Sanders. Um, workers have a right to organize. Now, some may disagree as to whether the protections for workers who choose to organize should also apply to, to, to workers who choose not to organize. That's my position, but examining this nuance is not an issue here. The title of today's hearing is, No Company is Above the Law, The Need to End Illegal Union Busting at Starbucks. Now, that clearly presumes that Mr. Schultz and his former employee are guilty before the allegations are fully investigated. The title suggests that this hearing is not a good faith effort to get at the facts. It's a smear campaign against an individual and a company, and a, and a, and a company based upon allegations that everyone knows are still under litigation. I am not here to defend Starbucks. I have my own questions about the alleged misconduct, and the law should be followed and upheld. I agree with the chair, no one is above the law. But let's not kid ourselves. This is not a fair and impartial hearing. 
Now, it's not surprising that Mr. Schultz was reluctant to testify. When the majority is used in the title of the hearing to slander the witness we're asking to testify, it sends a signal. The majority points to claims of Starbucks misconduct filed at the National Labor Relations Board to justify today's hearing. These allegations should be addressed and they should be investigated, period. But it would be malpractice for this committee to not also acknowledge that NLRB is currently facing its own credibility crisis. The NLRB confirmed there are four separate allegations of NLRB employee interference, three of which the employer was Starbucks pending before the board. It begs the question, are NLRB employees weaponizing the agency against American employers to benefit politically connected labor unions? The National Labor Relations Act was passed to provide an unbiased framework to review disputes between employers and employees. The NLRB carries out the law and is required to protect the rights of all parties in a labor dispute not put their thumb on the scale in favor of unions. But that is not what we appear to be seeing in practice. An NLRB hearing officer recently substantiated reports of voting irregularities in a union election at a Starbucks in Kansas that could potentially elevate to the level of misconduct by NLRB employees. This includes NLRB staff providing duplicate ballots, supplying union organizers with confidential voter information, providing voter accommodations to employees selected by the union without offering them to all employees. Regardless of the outcome, these actions are in direct violation of federal law and NLRB written guidelines. Now today, we'll hear from former Congressman Bradley Byrne. He is representing the brave whistleblower who brought this misconduct and weaponization of the agency to light. He'll be able to provide more insight into how the NLRB is operating in violation of its own practices and a procedure in a way which favors labor unions. Let's be clear, and one more time, workers have a legal right to unionize. Companies cannot break the law to prevent unionization. Similarly, Unions should not be allowed to intimidate workers into unionizing through coercion or by banning secret ballot elections, which the Supreme Court has stated, quote, indeed the preferred, end quote, method to gauge worker support of unionization. This is a conversation this committee can have and will continue to have. But the bottom line is that a federal agency has no right to break the law to advance a political agenda. And this should be something that our committee investigates on a bipartisan basis. If the committee is going to properly investigate concerns over labor relations at Starbucks, we should also investigate alleged misconduct of the agency that sought to influence the union representation process. At last week's hearing, I said we should thoughtfully examine legitimate policy issues, not hold show trials for public shaming. Today looks like more of what we saw last week. There are important bipartisan things the committee needs to accomplish. We need to work together on real solutions to issues facing American families, like the high cost of prescription drugs, getting Americans back to work, driving down inflation that is choking economic growth. Instead, we put CEOs on the dock, but instead of a cage in which the, in which the, uh, the, pr the prisoner was formerly kept, is a desk in front of the committee where a judgment has already been made. Thank you, and I look forward to today's testimony. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Uh, we will now turn to our witness. Uh, Mr. Howard Schultz is the former longtime chief executive officer of Starbucks and a member of the Starbucks Board of Directors. Mr. Schultz, you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Sanders, Ranking Member Cassidy, and Senators of the Committee. I'm pleased to be here this morning and tell the entrepreneurial story of Starbucks and how we have carried the American flag to 84 countries around the world. My vision for Starbucks Coffee Company has always been steeped in humanity, respect, and shared success. It's a vision that was inspired by the struggles of my father, a World War II veteran who slipped on a sheet of ice in 1960 
and was promptly fired from his job as a delivery driver. It fractured our family and it deeply scarred me. I decided at an early age that if I was ever in a position to run a business, it would be based on respect and shared success. With my one-year term as Starbucks interim CEO having come to a close, I appear before you today with love and gratitude for what we have built at Starbucks over these last 40 years. The essential operating approach at Starbucks since 1987, when we had just 11 stores, has focused on values-based decisions. We've always believed that if we exceed the expectations of our people, they in turn will exceed the expectations of our customers. We call our employees partners. This is a very important point to share with the committee. Because since 1991, we established shared ownership for every single person in the Star at Starbucks, full and part-time. Unprecedented. More than 30 years ago, before the company's IPO, Starbucks created two unprecedented benefits for our partners. It was the first of its kind in all of American business, never done before. Starbucks Beanstalk program, a stock equity program, and access to health care almost 25 years before the Affordable Care Act for full and part-time workers who work 20 hours a week. My written testimony has details on the benefits and opportunities we've created for our people over the past 40 years. This represents decades of work striving to build a different kind of company that lifts our customers and gives our partners a chance at a better life. According to Aon, one of the most respected benefits and HR consultancies in the country, this is their voice, not ours. There's literally no company, no company, in our competitive set of retail that offers higher value benefits than Starbucks in the United States. And Senators, we did this by building a direct relationship with our partners. Built on trust and shared success based on a 40-year track record of benefits and actions to create opportunity. Today, baristas in our stores earn on average $17.50. Respectfully, that's more than the minimum wage of every senator that's represented a state on this committee, including, respectfully, Chairman Sanders, where the minimum wage in Vermont is $13.18. We're at $17.50. With benefits and other income included, such as 100% paid college tuition, the first of its kind in American business, comprehensive health insurance and Beanstalk equity, the average value approaches $27 an hour. And what I'm most proud of is today 63% of our retail managers started out as hourly baristas, underscoring the opportunity we provide for shared growth and success and our employee retention is twice the industry average. Let me repeat, employee retention at Starbucks is twice the industry average. And throughout our history, we have addressed the issues most critical and most important to our people, including pay equity, paid sick leave, fully paid parental leave, support of our partner networks, financial literacy, sustainability, hiring military veterans and their spouses, over 30,000 to date, partnering on food security, and offering industry-leading mental health support. The vision and track record and ongoing pathway for employees has led our industry. A small number of our partners, about 1%, have chosen a different approach, as is their right under law. And while we, are, while we care deeply about each and every one of our partners, we are limited by law in what we can unilaterally in union, do in union environments. We are 100% committed to fulfilling our obligations as an employer under the National Labor Relations Act and are committed to good faith negotiations on first contracts for each unionized store. A year ago, I came back to Starbucks as interim CEO and concluded that assignment last week. While not a one-year fix, we are back on the right path and have demonstrated that by $1.4 billion of employee-facing investments that we made this year. Every day, we wake up thinking about how we can put our people first, put them in a position to win, and do everything we can to demonstrate the conscience, the heart, and the values of Starbucks Coffee Company. That has been the Starbucks way for the last 40 years, since 1987, when we had 11 stores and 100 employees. With that, I welcome your questions. 
Schultz, um, thank you very much. Uh, my time is limited as is the time of all of our members here. Uh, so I'm going to be asking you to respond to each question uh, as briefly as you can, hopefully with a yes or a no. Do you understand that in America, workers have a fundamental right to join a union and collectively bargain to improve wages, benefits, and working conditions? Do you understand that? I understand, and we respect the right of every partner who wears a green apron, whether they choose to join a union or not. Are you aware that NLRB judges have ruled that Starbucks violated federal labor law over 100 times during the past 18 months, far more than any other corporation in America? Sir, Starbucks Coffee Company unequivocally, and let me set the tone for this very early on, has not broken the law. Okay. Are you aware that on March 1st, 2023, an administrative law judge found Starbucks guilty of, quote, egregious and widespread misconduct, end quote, widespread coercive behavior, and showed, quote, a general disregard for the employee's fundamental rights, end quote, in a union organizing campaign that started in Buffalo, New York in 2021. Are you aware of that? I'm aware that those are allegations, and Congress has created a process that we are following, and we're confident that those allegations will be proven false. All right, Mr. Schultz, before answering the following questions, let me remind you that federal law at 18 U.S. Code Section 1001 prohibits knowingly and willfully making any fraudulent statement. I understand that. Were you ever informed of or involved in a decision to fire a worker who was part of a union organizing drive? I was not. Were you ever informed of or involved in a decision to discipline a worker in any way who was part of a union organizing drive? I was not. Have you ever threatened, coerced, or intimidated a worker for supporting a union? I've had conversations that could have been interpreted in a different way than I intended. That's up to the person who received the information that I spoke to him about. Were you informed of or involved in the decision to withhold benefits from Starbucks workers in unionized stores, including higher pay and faster sick time accrual? My understanding, when we created the benefits in May, one month after I returned as CEO, my understanding was under the law, we did not have the unilateral right to provide those benefits to employees who were interested in joining a union. Am I hearing you say that you were involved in the decision to hold benefits from Starbucks workers in unionized stores? Is that what I'm hearing? It was my understanding that we could not provide those benefits under the law. Mr. Silch, have you ever asked the Starbucks worker, quote, if you hate Starbucks so much, why don't you go work somewhere else? I'm glad you asked that question because I've read in the press uh, that quote, and that's not exactly what I said. Uh, can I tell the story? Do you mind? I have some other questions. I'm sorry. There are a lot of people. I think like it's that. important to hear the facts. All right, you'll have your chance. Will you commit to testifying in any trial where you personally are accused of breaking federal labor law, something that you have been accused of doing nearly 100 times since 2021? Mr. Chairman, let me say under oath, these are allegations, and Starbucks has not broken the law. Okay. Mr. Schultz, were you informed of or involved in, this, in the decision to close all Buffalo area stores in November 2021, just days before area union elections, in order for Starbucks employees to listen to you give a speech on why they should vote against forming a union, a meeting the NLRB has determined was a violation of the law? I think this is another area that I hope I get a chance to speak about. For the last 12 months, my involvement, my engagement, and my return to Starbucks has been primarily, I would say 95%, focused on the operations of our business, the customer, domestically and around the world. My involvement and engagement 
in union activities, despite this event today, has been de minimis. I was not involved in any issue of closing stores. Are you aware, Mr. Schultz, that an administrative law judge ordered you to record and distribute a video of yourself reading a notice to Starbucks employees about their rights under the National Labor Relations Act, how Starbucks violated those rights, and to assure that Starbucks will not infringe upon those rights in the future, and that this notice must be posted in all Starbucks stores and shared digitally to all of Starbucks employees. Are you prepared to read that notice? No, I am not, because Starbucks Coffee Company did not break the law. Under your leadership, Starbucks has repeatedly refused to bargain with any of the 7,000 workers in nearly 300 stores where workers have voted to represent themselves through union. The first group of workers to win their election have been waiting more than 460 days to reach a first contract. Mr. Schultz. Will you commit right now that within 14 days of this hearing, Starbucks will exchange proposals with the union, something it has refused to do for more than 450 days, so that meaningful progress can be made to bargain a first contract in good faith? Will you make that commitment? Because the arrangement that was made by the union and the NLRB in Buffalo to negotiate one single store at a time. We have met over 85 times for a single store. We've tried to arrange over 350 separate meetings. We've said publicly, and I say it here again, that we believe that face-to-face -face negotiations is the way to proceed. And the reason I want to make that point is that there have been safety issues in which Starbucks managers have been outed on social media. There are privacy issues. We don't want to do it on Zoom. We are prepared to meet face-to-face -face on a single store issue. Will you make a promise to this committee that you will exchange proposals with the union so that we can begin to make meaningful progress? On a single store basis, we will continue to negotiate in good faith. That's what we'll do. Three minutes over. Senator Cassidy. I, I defer to Senator Paul. Ayn Rand's Howard Rorick points out the ingratitude that man has for the entrepreneur, the creator. Thousands of years ago, the first man discovered how to make fire. He was probably burnt at the stake he taught the others to light. But he left them a gift that had not been conceived, and he lifted darkness from the face of the earth. Now, Starbucks didn't exactly discover fire. But Starbucks did somehow, somewhere, discover in the depths of man's soul that he would pay as much for a double mocha latte as he once did for a week's worth of coffee. My wife Kelly and I tried to get my grandparents some fancy coffee once, and my grandfather, a survivor of the Depression, informed us in no uncertain terms that he drank Maxwell House. $3.99 for a week's worth of coffee. The Pauls, although German, often miss the zeitgeist of the times, and so while we continue to purchase Maxwell House, others, our contemporaries, bought Starbucks stock and did much better than we did. Who knew people would pay six bucks for a cup of coffee? But I digress. Convincing the public to buy very expensive coffee is not the discovery of fire, but still it deserves respect. Instead, Congress convenes today not to praise Starbucks, but to bury them. The hearing today is convened to attack a private company for its success, when its success has benefited both customers and its employees alike. We've heard of the average wages, over $17. We've heard of the 401k plans. We've heard of the parental leave, even for part-time employees. Starbucks giving away tens of millions of dollars each year. They have 100% tuition and fee for bachelor's degree. Maybe it doesn't sound like too bad a place to work. Starbucks is among the most charitable companies in the country. Since 2016, they've had a program to give away unused food to feed over five million hungry families. Starbucks didn't do all this under orders from a government bureau. They did it because capitalism works. We have more charity when we have more money, when we have more success, when we have more profit. Nobody buys $6 coffee in impoverished nations. We're an extraordinarily rich nation. 
Marion Tupi and Gail Pooley wrote a book called Superabundance. They say we live in an era of superabundance. Starbucks can only exist in an era of superabundance. The average calorie count since when I was born was about 2,800. It's gone up to 3,700. Many would argue you have too much food. You can buy seven times as much food for the same amount of worker hours. If you measure stuff in time prices, how many hours of the average worker it takes to buy something, it's extraordinary how wealthy we are. Even in inflation-adjusted terms, from uh, 1960 to today, 1950 to today, the average income inflation-adjusted is up fourfold. These are all extraordinary tales. This is also an extraordinary tale of a company that started out of nothing and employs tens of thousands of people all making great wages, and we're here to say as if this is like, you know, Charles Dickens. I mean, we think it's 1812. I mean, it's an amazing success story we live in, the era of superabundance. In 1820, 96% of people lived on less than $2 a day. Adjusted for inflation, you know how much of the world lives that way? Less than 10%. Trade, capitalism, profit. People all the time are talking about, we want sustainable this and sustainable that. You know what's sustainable? Capitalism and profit and employment. You want to put all those Starbucks workers in the government dole? You want to have a government coffee company? You know, what are we talking about here? If you don't want their coffee, be like my family and buy Maxwell House. But for goodness sakes, don't deride one of the great American sex success stories. This is not who we are. We are better than this. If the goal is to destroy the goose that laid the golden egg, then by all means, this hearing is a good beginning. For me, I see the fabulous success of Starbucks, and I understand that luxury, the luxury to spend an extraordinary amount of money for a cup of coffee is a testament to capitalism. It's a testament to the fact that we have enough money that we can do that. When I walk in Starbucks, I don't see billionaires buying coffee. I see everyone from top to bottom in there paying for the coffee because they've decided the quality is worth it. But I don't want to be part of any witch hunt that vilifies any American business. So count me out. Count me as one who is ecstatic that Starbucks is an American success story and I'll have no part in trashing their success. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hickenlooper, you have to preside soon, so you ask the first questions. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Ranking Member. Um, and uh, Mr. Schultz, I appreciate you coming uh, before us, and uh, I realize that you've spent your life creating one of the most successful brands uh, in American history. Um, you mentioned the long-held aspiration to make Starbucks a company that balances profitability with social conscience, um, and I think that brand is, is exceedingly attractive, especially to young people, and I think it's part of your success. I think in many ways, the ability of Starbucks to attract young workers and, and, and have them believe in the brand and the vision is a big part of that success, which I think is part of what this group believes is that the, the partnership between the company and the workers is, is a key to success for, for any successful company. Um, many folks who work at Starbucks uh, came because they want a chance to work for a company that prioritizes earnings and benefits uh, wellness. And your testimony described in some detail that you're near the top of that ladder. Um, but we also heard over the last few weeks from other workers, uh, some from Colorado, who told us they came to work for the partner-centric model but were disappointed because they wanted that opportunity to, to be part of a union um, and told us that that disillusionment uh, has been very hard for them. Uh, so I guess the question I would ask first is that that appearance that so many of the employees have of that their organizing efforts are being interfered with uh, seems at odds with the commitment to the partner model uh, and, the, and the worker welfare. Uh, so how do you respond to those workers who appreciate the Starbucks model, but, but would like to be able to organize with less, uh, less confrontation. Well, thank you for the question and the opportunity to answer that, you know, without some of the propaganda that has been floating around. Um, you know, I've built my life trying to create a company that values 
every single person with dignity and respect who puts on the green apron. That has not changed as a result of 1%, 3,400 people out of 250,000 who want to join the union. We've said it publicly, we respect the law, we respect their right, and we want to treat everyone with respect and dignity. However, I have the right and the company has the right to have a preference. <clears throat> And our preference is to maintain the direct relationship we've had with our employees who we call partners. And we have a track record that demonstrates the values that we have, that we have shown and the value that we have created. But we maintain a level of respect for everyone who wears the green apron. Thank you. Um, there's been considerable questions about the shrinking middle class. Uh -huh. This is. I'm not asking you to be an economist sure. in this sense, although you clearly know more than about econ economics than I will ever know. Uh, but when you look at the charts, and we've got a chart behind me that demonstrates that as the middle class has shrunken and as in income inequality has uh, increased dramatically, it has directly coincided with the decline in unions. Um, and I certainly respect the the, the desire to be directly connected with all your employees. No. Uh, but in many ways, that, that right to organize and that opportunity for people to, to be part of a union uh, is a crucial building block for the middle class that I think gave this country stability that we don't, we don't see in the same way that we used to. Um, at its core, I think union organizing is about having a greater say in, in, their, in their workplace. Um, and I think everybody always wants that. The, some of the studies show that entrepreneurs start new businesses not necessarily to make money, but not to have someone bossing them around. So what do you say to the workers who want to join together with their peers to unionize uh, their workplaces, despite however great Starbucks has been for them? Yeah. I've, I've said before, and I, I, I want to repeat it, I, I think unions have served an important role in American business for many years. And if you look at the 50s and the 60s, unions generally were working on behalf of people in a company where those people have not been treated fairly, where there's been, in some cases, nefarious acts by the employer taking advantage of the employee. I can only say in my, in my own company, based on the track record that we've had, we do not believe, and it's our preference, that we are that kind of company. We treat our people fairly. We do nothing that is nefarious. We put our people first. We make decisions based on our people. And we have the track record to prove it. Starbucks is probably one of the best, if not the best, first job in America. As I said in my opening statement, 65% of baristas are now managers. I walked into a store an hour ago, just at 24th and M, just walked in was met by a guy named Nico, never met him before. 22 years with Starbucks, and he tells me his story. He came from Senegal, he's an American citizen, started as a barista, became a manager, district manager, and the thing that he wanted me to know, this is an hour ago, is I bought a house and I have a car, and I raised two kids because of Beanstalk at Starbucks. Now you put that overall, in the last 15, 20 years, over $2 billion okay. of equity because of Beanstalk, 14% of, of people's Senator face Hickenlooper, pay. your time has expired. So. Yeah. But it's an important point. $2 billion of equity because of everyone being an owner of Starbucks Senator has gone back to our employees. It's unprecedented. And that's why Starbucks doesn't need a union. Senator Cassidy. Um, Mr. Chairman, I will respectfully notice that you took seven minutes on yours, so Mr. Schultz should have been allowed to finish his statement. No, Mr. Schultz will have as much time as he needs to respond to the questions of 15 people. Senator Cassidy? I defer to Senator Romney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Cassidy. Uh, I, I recognize at the outset there's some irony uh, to a non-coffee-drinking Mormon uh, conservative uh, defending a Democrat candidate for president in perhaps one of the most liberal companies in America. Uh, that being said, I, I also think it's somewhat rich that, uh, uh, that, uh, that you're being grilled by people who have never had the opportunity to uh, create a single job. Uh, and yet they believe that they know better how to do so. 
and what's best for the American worker and what's best for the American economy, what's best for growth. I, I also think it's rich to not recognize the extraordinary conflict of interest we have, which is our, our Democratic colleagues overwhelmingly get their campaign funds from unions and therefore would like to find every possible way to extend unions, even if an enterprise feels that it's in their best interest to pursue a different course. Now, I know that there are a number of reasons why you might wish not to have uh, union organization in, in your various enterprises. At the same time, I agree with, with Senator Cassidy and with your own comments, Mr. Schultz, which is that, that uh, uh, people have a legal right to form a union. Uh, there are some employers that are not good employers, and a union is necessary to protect the rights of those individuals, and that if any enterprise, including yours, has broken the law, that it should be held accountable for having done so. At the same time, there are legitimate reasons why an enterprise might choose not to become unionized. Uh, I, I first would note that within your company, there are probably some stores that are union, some that are non-union. Do the non-union store employees get paid less than the union store employees? The starting wage has been the same. The only difference is the benefits that we created in May. And my understanding under the law is that we were not allowed to provide those benefits to people who are organizing to join a union. And so, in fact, the non-union stores are actually a little better uh, total package than, than the union stores. Let me ask another question, which is make another point, and that is, I would understand why you would not want to have an adversarial relationship between the store manager mm -hmm. and the employees that work there. I'd also understand that sometimes in some union mm -hmm. enterprises, there are work rules that prevent someone from going from a, let's say, a barista to becoming a manager. And, and you've indicated that if you will, career opportunities for people are enhanced when they're able to move from position to position and become a manager. Is that a concern of yours? No, I mean, I, can I tell one story Please. if I can? Uh, and it happens to be in the state of Vermont. Uh, and I think this is indicative of the situation that we are currently experiencing. Uh, there's seven stores in the state of Vermont that Starbucks has. Of the seven, one of them voted to join a union. This is important fact. 21 Starbucks people, partners, work in that store. How many people do you think voted to either become a union or not a union? Take a guess. Got me. I would presume the well, majority. I think when you hear the number, you'll understand the problem. 21 people in the store, six people voted. Six. Four, fo four voted to become a union and two voted for not. Now, I'm not saying why the other people didn't vote. That's up to the committee to decide. But you can imagine there's issues going on in a store like that where people work close together and influence people to do one thing versus the other. But here's the problem. Since that store, since six people voted to, to the union, of the seven stores in Vermont, this particular store has twice the level of attrition, and the majority of the people have left the store. And the tension that exists in any store that Starbucks has since its individual stores voting in a small group of people. There is lots of issues that we are dealing with. And overall, in the, in the stores that have voted for union, about 300 are twice the level of attrition that we currently have in the 99% of stores that have not voted for union. But the Vermont thing is not a proxy. The Vermont thing is exactly what's going on around the country. Thank you. I, I appreciate that perspective and, and would just turn to one other point, which is we talk about corporate greed all the time as if it's something brand new. Of course, profit incentive and greed has been there from the beginning of humankind. Uh, but there's also union greed. Uh, greed exists throughout our society uh, through various enterprises. But let me ask, uh, your company is highly profitable. It was profitable, I presume, very early on, became profitable as time went on. Where does all that profit go? Does it go to all pay you and the senior executives? Where, where does the profit go of an enterprise? Did it all go out in dividends or stock buybacks? Where has your profit gone over the history of your company? The majority of profits that Starbucks has made has gone back into infrastructure, roasting plants, $800,000 to $1 million to build a store. The profits of the company have gone back to the business. Now, what's most important, though, is when we create shareholder value, as we have for Starbucks through the years, our employees, our partners are sharing our shared success model in that profit because everyone has been an owner. And the first day that I came back, April 4th, 
2022, the first day, what did I do? The one thing that would get shareholders across the country who own Starbucks stock angry with Howard Schultz, and that is I stopped our buyback program on the first day. Our stock went down. I was not concerned about that, and I took that money, and I invested it right back into our people, which resulted in higher wages one month after I came back. Now, that is the only evidence I have, which is the fact that my operating style, which has been 40 years, Thank you, is to build a, a company that balances profitability with a level of shared success for our people. And we have the evidence to prove it, sir. Thank Senator you. Murray. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schultz, for coming before the committee. I appreciate it. Um, you have, I've listened carefully, and throughout your testimony, you've made it very clear that Starbucks prefers its workers not to be unionized. unionized. But I think you know that decision is up to workers under federal law. Um, I just have been disappointed, I have to tell you, from a number of my constituents I've been hearing from about some of the widespread anti-union efforts at Starbucks, including in Washington State, where the NLRB has certified 19 elections, as you know, at Starbucks stores. They have issued 71 complaints covering 31 unfair labor practice charges, and NLRB judges have issued two decisions now finding that Starbucks violated federal law. So let me just ask you a simple question. Do you agree that it is workers who get to decide whether they want a union? Uh, Senator Murray, I, I agree that the person at Starbucks has the right under the law to decide whether or not they want to join a union. And Starbucks Coffee Company also has the legal right to provide a vision for our employees, which currently represent 99% of the 250,000 who wear the green apron, that our vision is a preference to maintain our direct relationship. And in terms of what you said, as I said to Chairman Sanders, those are allegations, and Starbucks Coffee Company unequivocally has not broken the law. Um, let me just share with you, I, and I heard you answer Senator Hickenlooper with treating your um, employees with dignity and respect, yes. which I appreciate. But I am hearing from a number of folks really troubling reports um, about Starbucks refusing to allow credit card tipping, cutting employee hours, holding the loss of critical benefits like health care, uh, insurance and gender affirming care over the heads of employees who are trying to exercise their rights. And I've even heard reports, so you know, uh, about uncertainty for union employees about whether or not they would receive abortion travel be benefits, which all your workers receive. I I'm concerned when I hear from my constitu constituents about unfair threats of any kind or denying benefits unfairly, even when the union agrees to waive its right to bargain. I would assume you would agree that that doesn't constitute treating someone with dignity or respect if they are being threatened. Senator Murray, uh, you know, you and I have known each other for quite a while, uh, you being the senator of our home state. I think you have many times actually talked about Starbucks as a model employer in many of the uh, meetings that you've had and speeches that you've given. Uh, I do take offense, I have to admit, because it's quite personal when you bring up things that you've heard that are not true. We have never, ever taken any benefit away, and we never would, of anyone who was interested in joining a union. We simply have said that under the law, our understanding is we did not have the right to provide incremental benefits during the bargaining process. But Howard Schultz, the leadership team of Starbucks, the board of directors, some of whom are here today, would never take benefits away of any kind of someone who was involved in trying to join a union. Well, thank you for the answer. I'm giving you the question, so you have a right to respond. That's why I'm yeah. asking. Okay. But you should know that, that those are some of the things that I hear, and I wanted to hear your response. Yeah. Okay. And, and I've also heard allegations that Starbucks has interfered with employees' ability to testify, including in Seattle, where, where an administrative law judge found that Starbucks did that. Can you respond to that charge? I have, I have no knowledge of that, Senator Murray. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Cassidy. I defer to Senator Tuberville. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cassidy. Uh, Ms. Schultz, thank you for being here. Thank you. I know this, this is pretty tough at times, but uh, it's good to hear your side of the story. You know, I came from the coaching profession. You know, for years I talked to young kids every year at the beginning of the year about they all wanted and needed something. I always told them one thing. 
Only thing you get from me and from this country is an opportunity. And you took that opportunity and ran with it. And you've got a lot of people that work for you over the years and work for your company and their company and made something out of themselves. So thank you for that. You've, you've been a, a huge uh, uh, idol for this country in terms of what you've done. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot about what you give to your employees, health care and all that. You know, I, probably, I fully support unions. If people want to join a union, that's fine. I mean, I think that's what this country is about. Uh, sounds like Starbucks employees as a whole, what we've heard so far, have had a great working environment. I understand collective bargaining processes have ongoing with almost 300 individual stores, and you have to negotiate with each one of these individuals in each store, each individual, not each store. And I know that there have been difficulties in trying to navigate these individual negotiations. I'm sure obstacles have come up that are unique to each store. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Thank you. Yeah, you want uh, to be respectful, as we all do, of requests of any employee, and you want to make sure that every person or group that you deal with feels that their rights are being respected and their voices heard. This could even include employees with specific rights and protections in workplace. Is that correct? That's correct. I know this has been a long process that requires considerable effort on your side to do all this. So can you speak to me about the difficulties that you've been having in bargaining processes specifically in the unique issues that your average person might not understand? Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, when Buffalo uh, first emerged and there was a process to try and uh, decide whether or not we were going to negotiate per individual store or by district or region, it was the position of the union uh, to have it one store at a time. Uh, that created significant uh, complications and obstacles in the collective bargaining process. We now have to be put in a position to negotiate individual store, one by one, across the country, and set up individual meetings. Now, because in this process, Star Starbucks managers and district managers have had safety issues in which the union, union organizers have been at their home, they have been outed on social media that have been significant challenges for our people to maintain their personal safety. We have said we do not want these meetings to be anything but face-to-face -face so we know who's in the room. We don't know if there's a Zoom meeting of who is taping the meeting, who's in the background, and who is looking in on the meeting and whether or not they are part of the company, part of the union, or whatever. And so we have asked respectfully we will show up as we have 85 separate times in a face-to-face -face meeting, and we've tried to set up over 365 meetings. It is a very difficult scheduling issue and very difficult logistics issue. And we should not be held accountable for not showing up when all we're asking for is face-to-face -face bargaining. Thank you. I'd like to hear your story about your employee, if you'd tell. You got about a minute and a half. About? About, your, about the employee that you had the discussion. This morning? Uh, that you had the argument about. You might want to oh, go Oh, okay. Somewhere Thank else you for that. Yeah. Uh, when I came back to Starbucks, I held about 100 co-creation collaborative meetings across the country to understand from our employees what they were experiencing and the challenges of a post-COVID environment on their life at home, on their work life, work balance, et cetera. Those meetings were not about union negotiations. In fact, we made it clear, we're not here to talk about the union, we're here to talk about Starbucks. In a meeting in Long Beach, a Starbucks partner was trying to interrupt the meeting and start talking about the union. She happened to be sitting next to me. I didn't know she was recording it. I didn't know she was filming it. But it was clear that there was a disruptive mentality. I just turned to her and I said, if you don't like the company, if you hate the company, you could work somewhere else. It was not a threat. And going back to Chairman Sanders' question before, I can understand she may have misinterpreted what I said. It wasn't a threat. I didn't know I was being filmed. I just simply said, if you hate the company, you could go work somewhere else. Those 100 sessions that I attended are based on what we've done to improve the company, to understand the empathy and compassion we need to have for our people in a post-COVID environment. They were not union meetings. 
They were meetings to discuss Starbucks and the opportunity for our people. Thank, Thank you for the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much, and thanks for calling the hearing, Mr. Schultz. Welcome, and I want to welcome the, the workers in this room who have had to do so much, um, extend, expend so much effort over many years to uh, have the right to organize and bargain collectively, so we stand with you in that effort. I think that's a, a right that every single worker in the United States of America should have, the right to, to bargain collectively, to organize for, for wages and benefits. And too often in our country, workers don't have that right. I represent a state where workers over generations marched and mobilized and literally bled and died for the right to organize. It wasn't conferred upon them by some CEO or some, some boss. It, they had to fight for it, and that resulted, of course, in the National Labor Relations Act, which is still in effect, still the law of the land, despite repeated corporate attempts to undermine it. So we have a lot to talk about, not just with regard to Starbucks, but for workers generally. I wanted to start, Mr. Schultz, with a, a discussion about one of the firms that Starbucks hired. I'm um, told that when, during your tenure as CEO, you hired Littler Mendelssohn, one of the largest and mo most notorious union-busting firms in the country that reportedly charges upwards of $600 an hour for their services. It's been reported that in 2021, Starbucks shut down all stores in the Buffalo area, rented out the Hyatt Regency Hotel, flew you, Mr. Mr. Schultz, and Starbucks senior executives into town and forced workers to hear you give anti-union talking points. Mm. While Starbucks refuses to say how much they've spent on anti-union efforts, it's clear the company is willing to spend a significant amount of money on union-busting tactics. And guess what? Uh, under current law, federal law, Internal Revenue Service law, Starbucks is able to write off those costs as a run-of-the-mill business expense, meaning taxpayers. Taxpayers are subsidizing union-busting in the United States of America, including that of Starbucks. So, Mr. Schultz, I'd ask you, as a private citizen, in your personal capacity, do you believe that corporations should have the right to get a tax break, a taxpayer-provided subsidization, a tax break for union-busting activities? Uh, Senator Casey, you've said a number of things I'd like to respond to, but... Well, just answer that question yeah. first. No, I will. I mean, Starbucks Coffee Company is following the tax laws and the law that Congress has I didn't ask up. you for about Starbucks. I asked you about your personal view. Yeah. Do you think that, that that provision should stay as the law or should be changed? My personal view is we should follow the law that Congress has set up. Do you support that? I support the law. You support, you support the provision that allows, no. allows a company to hire union-busting firms and, and conduct other activity that no. interferes with the rights of workers to organize. I understand it's the law, but you're saying you support it. You would not support a change. Is that correct? I support the law, and I also take offense with you categorizing me or Starbucks as a union buster when that is not true. Well, look, I, you, you go to just March of this year. Uh, administrative law judge issued a 218-page yeah. decision yeah. finding, quote, egregious and widespread misconduct demonstrating a general disregard yeah for the employee's fundamental rights, yeah. unquote, uh, in Buffalo, New York. So I think there's plenty of evidence on the record in terms of what the National Labor Relations yeah. Board uh, has, has uh, yeah. set forth in their, their opinions and their work. Let me ask you another question before my time has expired. There have been complaints, and I want you to answer this if you know anything about it, that Starbucks is spying on its workers as they try to organize. Again, another National Labor Relations uh, Board administrative law judge recently wrote that Starbucks used headsets, headsets to, quote, closely supervise, monitor, and create the impression that employees' union activities are under surveillance. So we've heard about this about, with regard to other companies. Do you believe, and again, this is in your personal capacity, and you realize where you are now, do you believe that workers have, should have the basic dignity at work not to be surveilled by their employee, employers. Senator, I am incredibly proud 
of how we treat Starbucks partners and have since That's fine. 1987. That's, I understand I'm, your, your I'm not product. aware of anyone surveilling anyone. At You're not aware of that? I am not. Do you support that? No, I would not support that. Thank you, Mr. Can I Can I come back and, and just address something you said, if you don't mind? Uh, you talked about Buffalo. Uh, I just want to clarify, but what I understand, the activities in Buffalo began in August of 21. I was not the CEO at the time. I came back in April of 22. But I want to share with the committee uh, what we have found out about the organizing in Buffalo. And I think this is important for everyone to know. The organizing in Buffalo began with an individual who we later found out was paid for and joined Starbucks as an employee in 2020. And even though we hired her on her own merit, we found out that she was paid for by the very union trying to organize Starbucks. All right, I'm going to have to cut you off. Uh, so Nick. That was a good story. We'll come back to that because it sounds like something to do. I, I hope you do. I'll defer to Senator Mark Wayne Muller. Well, thank you. And uh, considering the chairman doesn't want to hear any of that information because he's, I believe he's pretty biased in his opinion already. Ms. Schultz, I'll give you an opportunity to finish that if you'll do it quick. Thank you very much. So as you might imagine, uh, we're very curious to understand what happened in Buffalo. And uh, we later found out that this individual, which, which was hired in 2020, was paid for and under the employment of the union that was basically trying to organize Starbucks. We later found out there was more than one person. And so you might want to ask yourself, uh, what, where's the fairness, right. the objectivity, and the integrity of what we're, we're talking about here today? No, and I, I, I mean, if you're anti-union as a CEO, you're anti-union busting or you're for union busting. I'm not saying you're anti-union. I'm just saying that it seems like to me as a former CEO, not nearly at the success that you were at, sir, and I'm not trying to defend your company uh, because quite frankly, politically, we're on totally different ends of the spectrum. Um, and so the irony of this hearing is actually kind of funny. And I do want to point out some hypocrisy about this hearing with the chairman. And it's not trying to get personal. All this information is going to be very public. But the fact that you can't defend your company because you want to have a good relationship with your employees and you believe in employee value, which we all do. Any CEO knows that the success of our companies are based on our employees. We get that. Um, but it seems like unions today, all they want to do is fight with, the, with, the, with their, their employees or their employer. The same employer that is hiring those, those team members. And that friction causes a, a, a very volatile and, 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 and tough workplace. And if the company and the employees aren't in the same boat, rowing in the same direction, then they can't, neither one can be successful. And, 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 and unions themselves, if you're part of a union, you can never be an executive, you can never be a manager, and never be a CEO. And if you can't be an executive or a manager or the CEO, then how are you actually going to implement the changes that the unions want in those, in those positions to begin with? And it seems like they actually hold back their team members. Mm -hmm. But I take offense to, to the, the chairman pointing out that all CEOs are corrupt because they're millionaires. You know, if you make a lot of money, you're, you're corrupt. If, yet no. it, it, yet it, it's, it's bothering to me because, Mr. Chairman, you yourself have been very successful. Rightfully so. Glad you have. And you've been in office for 28 years, and you and your wife has, have, have immersed a wealth of over $8 million. And, and in fact, your quote on, 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 being, on, on being wealthy and being a millionaire was, well, if you write a bestseller, you can be a millionaire too. If you can be a millionaire, why can't Mr. Schultz and other CEOs be millionaires and be honest too? If that's the case, then why is it that Mr. Schultz, who actually creates jobs and a bestseller of a book, isn't creating any jobs? Why is it that he's corrupt and you're not? Why is it that all CEOs are corrupt because they're wealthy, and yet our chairman, who is wealthy, and I'm glad you are, you're not. Guys, the government's role is to create an environment for entrepreneurs, for go-getters, for, for world changers, to be successful in life. The U.S. government is, to des is designed for people that want to succeed can. We can go out and achieve anything that we choose to. But when you lean towards socialism, 
what you think is government is the answer and unions are the choice. And if you're against us, then you're dead wrong and you must be corrupt. That's not the world we're living in. That's not the America that we believe in. And I'm not against unions. If you want to choose to be in a union, be in a union. But if you choose not to, then you choose not to. And that's why I'm good with right-to-work states. That's honestly why unions actually thrive in Oklahoma and we're right-to-work states. Because it creates a happy environment and a, and a good environment. Because employees get to choose what they want to be part of. And the employer can have a say in it. What is wrong with choice? What is wrong with employees having a choice? What is wrong with the CEO defending his company and openly saying that he is providing good benefits and paying higher than everybody else? But yet, if you're not part of a union, you're also paying starvation wages. What hypocrisy? What bias? Chairman, you are chair of the health, education, Labor and Pension Committee. We shouldn't have a biased approach. We should have what's best for America and all those that want to thrive and work in it. And so while we politically disagree, Mr. Schultz, I applaud you for your success. And I applaud all the CEOs out there for their success and all the employees that work hard, that's in the same boat, that's making their companies great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me respond. As the senator did mention my name, I think. <laughs> and I think you got an all-time record here. You've made more misstatements in a shorter period of time than I have ever heard. Please correct well, me. Well, if I'm worth eight million dollars, excuse me. It's all public. Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Excuse me. Yes, sir. If I'm worth eight million dollars, that's good news to me. <laughs> I'm not aware of it. That's a lie. All right. Number two. Part of public records. That's, you're probably looking at some phony right-wing internet stuff. It ain't true. No. All right, you should read beyond that. It is not true. It's part right? of public records. It, no, it is not public record. Okay. Well, you made it 1.7 not million on your public book. public record. You made 1.7 right? on your book. Excuse me. I've got the mic now. Number Did you two. Make the statement I have that you the be mic a now. I've got it. You Did had you not make time. that statement? You had your time. Okay. All right. You're not telling the truth. Second of all, you got no evidence that I have ever said that all CEOs are corrupt. I have never, ever said that. Probably not Further, all, but, but every time you talk about not, CEOs, you, you shouldn't shouldn't say that. Say it. Furthermore, what this hearing is about is whether or not you talk about being pro-union, really. What this hearing is about is whether workers have the constitutional right to form a union. The evidence is overwhelming, not from me but for the National Labor Relations Board is the time after time after time, despite what Mr. Schultz is saying. Starbucks has broken the law and has prevented workers from joining unions to collectively bargain for decent wages and benefits. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Schultz, I want to begin by acknowledging the uh, leadership role your company has played in providing uh, benefits to workers. You talked about it in your testimony with great pride, uh, comprehensive health benefits um, to uh, uh, full and part-time employees starting in 1988, and stock awards to all employees since uh, 1991. You noted, uh, I think, that these benefits allow you to attract and retain a workforce that you call the secret sauce of the Starbucks success. Given this history, though it is all the more puzzling to me um, that you're fighting this union drive so fiercely. Um, you've said that a union will sever the direct relationship you have with employees, which you call crucial to anticipating their needs. In, instead of leaving it up to your anticipation, a union can ensure that you receive clear feedback about what your workers actually need, free from fear of retaliation. While you call them partners, 
your workers are limited in their ability to engage with you directly because there's a power differential uh, and uh, you have power over them and the benefits that they cherish. Mm -hmm. A power you have shown your willingness to wield uh, involving employees attempting to organize. I, I, I find it um, particularly ironic, especially given your own powerful story, uh, that you don't see this power dynamic. I, further, I think this number is right for your US employee base, but you employ over 235,000 people in over 3,000 in my home state of Wisconsin alone. You can't possibly have a direct relationship with all of them. Some intermediary is necessary. If you truly want a direct relationship with your workforce, I would suggest to you that a union can provide that. Uh, I also want to note in your written testimony that you returned to Starbucks in April of last year and noted that the company had gone astray, had fallen, lost its way on many levels. Uh, you talked about short-termism, an issue on which I agree profoundly. Uh, and who were these partners to turn to with this direct relationship during this time that the company had gone astray? Um, in Wisconsin, I, when I met with Starbuck union organizers, it was immediately clear to me that they take significant pride in their work. Uh, you talked a little back and forth about the, um, uh, uh, the quote of hating Starbucks so much, why don't you quit or get a job somewhere else. These workers don't want to quit. They want to work. In fact, they seem to share so many of the same goals for the company that you've laid out so eloquently in your testimony. All of these workers are asking is that you respect their right to organize, which would require you to treat them not just as partners, but as equals. It's that power dynamic that I was talking about. So on that note, Mr. Schultz, it has been almost one year since the first Wisconsin store voted to unionize. I want to ask you on the record when uh, Starbucks will begin bargaining in earnest with those workers and when can I expect uh, that I'll hear that the first contract has been signed? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'd love to answer your question. I, I wonder if I can have more time to respond to some of the things you've said. But uh, we are prepared in the state of Wisconsin and other states that we have uh, partners who want to join a union to meet face to face, as we stated consistently, and begin a bargaining process. And we're prepared to do that in Wisconsin. I, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if I could just speak to a few things that the senator had mentioned. You have about 50 seconds. Uh, okay. Uh, Starbucks has had almost 5 million people wear the green apron. 5 million. So we've created close to 5 million jobs. 5 million jobs. Just think about how many families have benefited from Starbucks. The majority of those partners have participated in an equity plan, unprecedented in American business. 14% of their base pay is how we started. In addition to that, 99% of the 350,000 who work for Starbucks want a direct relationship with the company. In addition to that, what's the most important metric of any business? And that is trust with your people. And as a result of that, I'm sorry. We, have, we, we have the highest level of retention of any company in our sector. That's hundreds of companies. The highest level of retention. Mr. Schultz, I, there are time limits here. Senator Cassidy. I defer to Senator Brown. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ranking Member. I think this is an interesting discussion because I recently come from the world of building a business over 37 years. And, I've been clear when it comes to unions, 
They are so important in today's world vis-a-vis -vis large public companies, multinationals. How would you have any uh, countervailing clout unless you didn't have an effective union? I think this is interesting because the restaurant business, I think, currently has maybe 3 to 4 percent of it unionized. And one of the reasons, since I had a small business for 17 years, 15 employees, before it grew. And the best avoidance of a union is to treat your employees like family, pay good wages, have good benefits. You do that, you're probably never going to have a union knocking at your door. But we're talking about an industry here that through COVID went through one of the most traumatic events any small enterprise or business has gone through. This is not a small enterprise or business, but it's in a business. It's got a high fatality rate due to the nature of it. I don't know currently what you're paying your average uh, employee on the line. Uh, that's going to be the first question. And then what the average pay of senior middle management, senior management would be. I always thought it was good, as long as you're earning equity in whatever you're doing, that you probably be reasonable there. Uh, don't pull in with a Maserati um, and all of that. I'd love to know where you're at on that wage stratification first. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we, the, the average wage is $17.50. That's higher than the minimum wage of every state in America. The, uh, with benefits, and the majority of our, of our people take the benefits, that's at $27 an hour. 65% of our managers across the country were baristas, and all in, the manager's salary is about $80,000. Very good. And then do you have a uh, stratum of uh, management above that? Is a district manager, regional manager, and I think what we're most proud of is that the majority of people who are managing stores, managing districts, managing regions, started out in our stores. We have hundreds, maybe thousands, of beautiful stories that our partners have shared with us about what Starbucks has done for them and their families as a result of the benefits that we created. And those benefits were not created because there was a union. Those were, those were created because of the decisions. And I think that's important to note. But I think what you represent here is a watershed case because mm -hmm. you're large. Mm -hmm. You generally get large because you're successful along the way. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be careful because I'm going to pivot to something the other side of the aisle has proposed is like the PRO Act. And again, I'm probably the most outspoken Republican on the benefit of unions. But you got to be careful where they go. If they're going into the gig economy, uh, into the independent contractors, which is the next chapter on some of this, that will stifle entrepreneurialism. When you look at if you are large, you shouldn't necessarily be held to account unless there are things that you're doing to impede uh, the law in terms of unionizing. You've already made that point that you don't think you've been doing it. All I'm saying, this is important because this will have a ripple effect way beyond your business. And the one thing we can't have is to suffocate what's made this country great, and that is that you do not necessarily have to wrestle with a union if you do all the things that are good for your employees to begin with. Can you honestly say that you've done that throughout the history of your company and that I know you have mobility. It sounds like uh, several different ways you can grow. You have no mobility unless you're growing as a company. But have you honestly done that? Uh, yes, we have, sir. And I wonder if I could just give you one prime example that I think the committee should understand. You know, during COVID, as you said, the restaurant industry was really plummeted. I mean, they, they, we, we had it very, very tough. We had thousands of Starbucks stores closed. Many of our peers started cutting benefits during COVID. Starbucks did not cut one benefit during COVID, and we paid every single partner during COVID with no exception. What was your average wage before COVID? Because you said you're at about $17 now starting. Uh, did you have to raise it we, over the last we did, we couple of years? We raised wages in May. That's correct. And what was it before? About $15 an hour. We went to 17 And one final point. 
even $17 an hour, that's not a living wage in this day and age. I'm proud that in our company we pay the highest starting wage in a low unemployment county. And any large corporation shouldn't necessarily be bragging about $15 to $20 wages. When you look at the typical structure of a large company, that should probably be $20 plus, like many Main Street businesses pay. And I think if companies like yours and the larger companies don't do it, you're going to be constantly, you know, grappling with maybe here. But on the other hand, unions shouldn't be trying to get involved in companies that are doing a good job, especially Main Street and smaller ones. I wish we had more time. Thank uh, you. We'll leave it at that. Thank you, sir. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, or good morning, I think it is still. Um, Mr. Schultz, you repeatedly call your employees partners. Do you value your employees or your partners that want to join a union or have joined a union? Do you value them as much as you value those that have not yet joined a union? You know, we have respect for every single partner who wins a green apron, regardless of their choice to, vote a, to go for a union. So yesterday, I had the opportunity to meet with um, some unionized Starbucks workers from Minnesota, Gracie and Elizabeth. And they tell me that uh, Starbucks is cutting their weekly hours. They estimate that they're losing $4 an hour in wages because the company won't allow them in unionized stores to access credit card tipping. Um, when that's available to workers in non-unionized um, shops. And they tell me that they are simultaneously understaffed in their stores and unable to get enough hours to pay their bills. If these folks are your partners, why are you treating them differently than the non-unionized workers? When we raised wages uh, in May, uh, we were, uh, my understanding was that we, under the law, we did not have the unilateral right to provide those benefits to partners who were involved in collective bargaining. And that is, that is why. So you have said that several times during this yeah. meeting. You've said that you cannot legally provide these benefits without bargaining over them. But you know, I'm sure, that the union has specifically stated in this letter, um, July 15th, 20, 2022, that they waived any objection uh, to bargaining on this. It says in the letter, to this end, the union hereby waives any objection that we might have to Starbucks providing union represented employees with any wage or benefit improvements provided to unrepresented employees. So I don't think this, I think, I, I just think you're wrong. Oh, let, me, let, let me try and explain. Uh, there are an array of wages and benefits that need to be negotiated in the collective bargaining process. It, it just, it would not be proper to take one piece of the puzzle out of the negotiating process since the union, the people who have joined the union have decided that they want to negotiate a contract. It is our preference and our right to negotiate that contract fairly and objectively, but not in piecemeal. Yep. So um, I think that the way the law reads is that there is an exception to that requirement to negotiate when the employees make a clear and unmistakable waiver to bargaining. But let me ask you about this because the first Minnesota store union was certified over 320 days ago, and no meaningful bargaining has happened since then, though there have been some meetings. Do you know how long those meetings have been in Minnesota? Uh, I'm not involved in any of the meetings. So the Minnesota folks tell me that those negotiation sessions have not lasted longer than six minutes. So that seems to me, sir, as a failure to negotiate in good faith. When, from my understanding, in, in many of the meetings that we've showed up to have face-to-face -face meetings, the other side has decided to put on a Zoom or a Teams, and then we decide, and we've told them up front, that we will not negotiate unless the meeting is in person and we know who's in the room. And so we have left those meetings as a result of the fact that we could not preserve the privacy and the integrity of a face-to-face -face meeting. So... My observation here is that this feels like sort of a catch-22 because you um, are not willing to bargain on issues like uh, credit card tipping while we are simultaneously, you're not coming together to bargain at all. And so I think that that is why the employees are feeling, who are wanting to be in a union that feel so frustrated. But I want to just touch on one other thing. I've been listening really closely to you today, and um, um, I also come from the private sector, 
um, had my own company at one time before I moved into the, into the public sector. And I've been really struck by your focus on what an excellent company you are. Um, and honestly, it sounds as if you are personally offended or even insulted that anyone would question you or your company. And it seems as if you feel that only bad companies should be unionized, that there's something nefarious about a company that has done something bad and therefore they need to be unionized, and that Starbucks doesn't need a union because you are a good company. But I think, Mr. Schultz, that is not your decision to make, and I believe that there is an inherent value in coming together to organize that would address this imbalance of power that I think the many, many Starbucks Senator, partners right. you're sitting behind you and in Minnesota yeah. feel. I mean, you're a billionaire, and they are your employees. The imbalance of power is yeah. extreme, and that is why people want to come together to form a union. Senator, I agree with you that I do not have who can vote for a union or not. But I am the chairman, I am the CEO of the company, and, or I, I was the CEO of the company, and I have the preference and the right to communicate to our people about what it is we believe is right for Starbucks. And I want to repeat, 99% of the 250,000 want a direct relationship with the company. And the last thing you said, and it's been said many times by the chairman, I just want to make a point of that. This, this monarch of billionaire, let's just get, get at that, okay? I grew up in federally subsidized housing. Let me finish. I grew up in federally subsidized housing. My parents never owned a home. I came from nothing. I thought my entire life was based on the achievement of the American dream. Yes, I have billions of dollars. I earned it. No one gave it to me. And I've shared it constantly with the people of Starbucks. And so anyone who keeps labeling this billionaire thing is... Mr. Schultz, I, I don't mean to cut you off. We have time limits here, and you have well, the I opportunity. Think, I, I'm not cutting no, you it's, off. It's your, it's your moniker constantly. It's unfair. No, it is I not. Earn, you have had more time. Well, I've been generous with the time. Yeah, I'm but, sorry. But, Mr. Chairman... We have a room yeah. full of people. Yeah. We have a panel to go after you. Fine, You're not the fine. only person testifying. Okay. Senator Cassidy. Defer to Senator Marshall. <laughs> Thank you, Ranking Member. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Schultz, I'm going to change the subject a little bit. Last year, your company decided to close 16 stores across the nation, including the Starbucks down the street here at Union Station, due to rising crime in these cities. Shortly thereafter, you stated that there are going to be many more closures for similar concerns. Your store managers are quoted saying that their employees have not felt safe amid a spike in crime, a surge of assaults, thefts, and drug use. I agree, in fact. In, in fact, I fear for my own staff walking home in this neighborhood. I feared so much that I purchased each one of them one of these noisemakers this past Christmas. One of our colleagues' office staff was recently violently assaulted as well. The lawlessness in this country is out of control. When you decided to close those 16 stores because you feared for your employees' safety, did you then and do you still believe that the White House needs to focus on restoring law and order and relaying a message to this country of respect for the brave men and women in law enforcement in this country? Thank you, Senator. Uh, we do, in fact, have a significant issue of safety in urban cities around America. And Starbucks has closed many, many stores that were profitable as a result of the fact that our own people do not feel safe working in the stores. And we have a situation of homelessness, drugs, mental illness, and uh, as a result of that, many of the societal issues that we're facing today are difficult for Starbucks to address because we don't have the power or the responsibility to address these things as you've described. You know, thank you for, the, um, for your answer and your honesty. It's a sad day for this nation when the crime is so bad that you feel the need to close profitable shops because you can't keep your employees safe at their place of work. And I have to note for the record that every single location you closed, all 16 of them, were in Democrat-ran cities. We have another saying. I want to change, change the subject here again. We have a saying back home that pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. You, you do have 645 unfair labor cases brought against you. Based upon the size of the crowd, there may be some... some smoke and fire together there. 
you know, this is your chance. Tell me your side of the story. Tell me why you have so many complaints. Do you feel like that there's been a fair negotiation process? Have you been, have you and your company been open right. to negotiation uh, process? So this is, you know, give you a minute here, a minute and a half, just yeah. to tell me your side of the story. Thank you. Uh, first off, with regard to the NLRB, uh, Senator Cassidy mentioned a number of issues. Starbucks Coffee Company will abide by the law and follow the process. I, I, I hope the committee uh, does investigate many of the things that are going on within the NLRB and the, the courage of the whistleblower to come forward with regard to the allegations that she has, uh, that she wants to discuss with the committee. Um, this process, unfortunately, has played out publicly in many different ways. And unfortunately, a public company in America today is, is unfortunately uh, guilty before the, the, the before anything. So this is your chance. Yeah. So why are you innocent? Yeah, we're, we're innocent because we've done everything that we possibly can to respect the right under the law of our partner's ability to join a union. But conversely, we have consistently laid out our preference without breaking any law of communicating to our people about what we believe is a vision for the company. And when I went to Buffalo, even though it was cited before by Senator Casey, I never mentioned the word union once. I talked about the vision for Starbucks. And the reason is, post-COVID, 95% of the people wearing the green apron had worked for the company less than a year. They didn't know anything about Starbucks. So I went to Buffalo to share the story of Starbucks, what we have done as a company, equity in the form of stock auctions, comprehensive health insurance, all the things that we've done to provide opportunity for our people. I didn't go there to talk about the union. I went there to lay out our vision for the company. And I consistently have done that as well as the leaders of Starbucks. We have not broken the law. We have simply tried to defend ourselves and tell our employees, all of them, what we stand for, our future, the aspirations we have, the growth of the company, and the opportunity. Starbucks is, in many ways, the quintessential entrepreneurial company of the last 30 years. We've created, created 5 million jobs from a cup of coffee, and we've shared the profits with our people. And we've done all these things because, not because of the union, because of the compassion, the empathy, and in many ways, my own story of understanding what happened to my father and trying to build the kind of company that my father never got a chance to work for. And that is the story of Starbucks. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, um, collective bargaining is a fundamentally conservative idea. Right? We've sort of lost track of that. I mean, it's rooted in free market principles, right? The idea that workers should be able to freely join together to negotiate in a free, open negotiation with their employer. Um, and so it's kind of disappointing and sad and wild to me at how sort of partisan this debate has become. Democrats standing up for unions, Republicans saying they support collective bargaining, but not seeing that there's real genius in the idea in a free market society that workers get to come together. Um, you know, it's funny, <laughs> previous Republican candidates, um, you know, they really fought hard to work to win the union vote, to speak at union conventions. Um, this sort of new dichotomy we have is, in fact, new. Um, Mr. Schultz, what do you mean when you say that you abide by the law? So I, I guess when I do a search online to take a look at um, cases that have been brought against Starbucks for illegal firings, um, as you know, um, New York, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Kansas, Missouri, Washington, a decision out of Buffalo, uh, requiring you to reinstate workers, sure. calling your practice egregious and why call, uh, calling your practices egregious and widespread and misconduct. You say you follow the law, but then, of course, this committee sees repeated evidence of NLRB orders forcing you to reverse actions that were on their face a violation of the law. So when you say you don't break the law, you abide by the law. You're, you mean you disagree with all of these decisions from the NLRB? You think they got it wrong in all of those cases? 
I think what you're talking about is allegations that we look forward to in the process to defend ourselves. But if I can give you one specific case. But these are, or, but these are, but some of these are orders from NRLRB judges to reinstate employees based upon violations of conduct. Do you think in all of those cases in which judges have required stores to be reopened or for workers to be reinstated, yeah. that they just all got it wrong? Well, in, in Memphis, as an In every case. So in Memphis, as an example, uh, we, we do have. Well, I'm not actually looking well, for. I'm not. I, I, well, sorry, I think it'll be, it'll I'm not be, looking to litigate each specific I'm not, case. I'm, I'm just. Litigated. I just just to clarify, when you yeah. say that you are abiding by the law, you mean that in every case in which an NLRB judge has ordered you to take steps to remediate actions, in every single case they've gotten it wrong. We will follow the law and follow the judge's order, but we look forward. Right, to but the but the judge is making a finding that you have engaged in. In, in conduct that is not allowed by the underlying law, i.e. illegal behavior. In every case, you believe that the judges got it wrong. I believe the allegations will prove that Starbucks was correct. And I can give you a perfect example if you're willing to listen. Uh, sure, I'm willing to, I'm willing to okay, listen. Okay, so let's take Memphis, which has been a, uh, a clear uh, isolated case, but I think indicative of the process. Safety at Starbucks is critically important. We want to protect and preserve the safety of every one of our people. In 1997, we had a tragedy in Georgetown where three Starbucks partners were murdered. And so as a result of that, we, we have always taken safety very seriously. But after that, everything we do is about partner safety. Now in Memphis, a Starbucks person, an, who agreed to join the union after hours opened up that store for activities that were not consistent with safety and procedures at Starbucks. No one should open up a store that is closed. The manager took a disciplinary approach and terminated that person. That person was reinstated. That is the fact. Safety is key at Starbucks. So we can't be held accountable for things that we believe under the procedures of Starbucks that are based on safety for our people. And that is a clear violation of our procedures. I, I, I understand. I just, I'm trying to square your testimony in which you insist that you rigorously follow the law yes. with, with overwhelming evidence from the organizations that are charged with enforcing American labor law that that is not the case. It is akin to someone who has been ticketed for speeding a yeah. hundred times, yeah. saying I've never violated the law because every single time, every single time the cop got it wrong. That, that would not be a believable contention if someone was to make that before the committee. And so um, I find it hard to believe your insistence that notwithstanding this extraordinary set of decisions, reinstating workers, forcing stores to be reopened, that you are in fact consistently abiding by the law as your testimony is before this committee. I, I don't believe Starbucks has broken the law. All right, thank you. Senator DeCassidy. Let me just uh, make a couple observations relative to what has been said on the other side of the, of the aisle of the, of the dais. Uh, first, we should have, as I mentioned earlier, an investigation as to NLRB activities. They're being made out as if they're a totally objective uh, player in all this circumstance. But here I have a letter from NLRB confirming that they, uh, the OEOIG is investigating allegations of misconduct by the NLRB employees in Region, region 14. Um, now, uh, we can say, oh my gosh, NLRB is supposed to be neutral. There is tangible evidence that they're not. Secondly, um, I'm, I'm sorry Senator Murphy left. Republicans down here have totally supported the right of people to, to organize. I'll also point out that it was Republicans who were standing up for the trade unions when his first week of his presidency, uh, Joe Biden canceled the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, canceled it when those trade unions needed those jobs to make their pensions. And by the way, if I may point out, Subsequently, the administration has gone hat in hand to Venezuela and the Middle East asking for more production. If they had not canceled the pipeline, 
that oil would now be coming down to the state of Louisiana, employing more workers in my state, refining that, way and refining that oil in the most environmentally sensitive way. So I kind of stand by our side. Mr. Schultz, um, let's explore a little bit. There's this impression that the uh, unionization effort has occurred organically. But you mentioned earlier, and I think I have some facts here, that the person in Buffalo was making $69,000 a year when she went to work for the, when she went to work for the store and began to organize. I think that's called salting, but it wasn't as if there's this organic, let's just all come together and unionize. Um, no, workers of the world unite. It was, no, somebody was paid to go in there and create an environment where four out of six people might do it. I don't know if that was the four out of six union. Any comments upon this person getting paid by the union when she came to your store in an attempt to organize it? Well, if that's not a nefarious act, I don't know what is. Yeah, uh, it does seem just a little bit inorganic. Yeah. Um, you made, uh, or your company made in a 2023 proxy statement that Starbucks has not been found to have violated the law as part of any enforced order of the NLRB. Now, Senator Murphy suggested that you are guilty because you've been charged, and yet you're pointing out that you've not been found to violate the law. Will you kind of reconcile those two statements? That, uh, that is correct. Uh, we have not been found guilty of any violation. These are allegations. We look forward to the process that Congress has set up, and, to, and I think we will avail ourselves that these will be proven not true. Now, I just made the point, I forget if I, if I requested this, but I would like to enter to the record the letter from NLRB confirming that they are being investigated for NLRB employees' uh, misconduct in Region 14. Without objection. Do you have any comments upon what I feel is to be the politicalization of NLRB? From your perspective, is that a real thing? Uh, you know, I, I don't really have any comment on that. I hope the committee will look closely at it. Okay. Now, there's been a lot made that contracts have not yet been achieved, so-called first contracts. I have something here from a Bloomberg report that it took, um, on average, 465 days for first contracts in a variety of industries to be achieved. More than a half took more than a full year or to sign. It's being argued that you're not negotiating in good faith because you have not yet achieved the contract. And yet that seems to be consistent with the pattern of how these first contracts come about. Is there any statement you'd like to make on that? I think that's true. As I said earlier, we've shown up about 85 times uh, to have a face-to-face -face meeting. We've tried to set up 365 additional meetings. And we are very clear, we're ready and able to have face-to-face -face negotiations, and we will do so at a moment's notice. Now, NLRB's uh, general counsel, Jennifer Abruzzo, found that you had violated federal labor law by refusing to bargain if some attended over Zoom. Um, I didn't realize it was a law that you had to be able to go over Zoom, but any comment upon Ms. Abruzzo, who some have found to be an advocate for unions uh, in terms of this particular uh, finding? You know, I, I think, you know, I've been in business for many, many years, face-to-face, meetings, negotiations, collaborative sessions, they're all better to be had than anything that is on Zoom. Is there it, a law that says that you have to do it over Zoom if one party chooses to go over Zoom? I've never heard of that law, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, I haven't heard of it either. I yield. Senator Hassan. I'm happy to yield to Senator Markey for a minute, and then I'll follow up after him if that works. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for this important hearing. And Mr. Schultz, it's uh, good of you to show up, but then again, you face little choice. It's disappointing to me that it took such a long time and required the threat of a subpoena for you to appear before this committee. And it's frankly disrespectful to your hundreds of thousands of employees, uh, but we do appreciate you finally appearing here. All across America, workers are saying that they've had enough rising inequality and outlandish CEO pay for those at the top, like you, and a paycheck to paycheck subsistence for everyone else. The unionizing Starbucks workers are on the front lines as a groundswell of working and middle class people 
who are banding together to assert their right to organize, form a union, and collectively bargain for their dignity. My father used to tell me that you can't beg for your rights, you have to tell them. He lost his finger in an industrial accident as a young man. There was no OSHA. He just said, the boss said, see you next week, John, back on the job. That was before unions. That was before rights were put on the books. And ultimately, that's what Starbuck workers are doing. Workers in Buffalo are the spark that's lit the fire of organizing its locations across the country, including 15 Starbuck locations in, Amer in Massachusetts. The American people are watching. Public support for unions hit a record high late last year with 71% of Americans approving of labor unions. So as you sit here denigrating your workers, you're not just morally and legally wrong, you're in the minority. You're out of touch. Union busting is disgusting. I got the chance this week to meet with Caitlin, who is a Starbucks employee from Gardner, Massachusetts. Like you, Caitlin cares deeply about Starbucks. She originally started working for the company in 2006 and came back to rejoin Starbucks in 2021. When she came back, she saw Starbucks similar to how you describe it in your testimony, a company that had lost its way. She saw a company that now only cared about money mm. at the expense of the health and well-being of its workers. So to help save the Starbucks she once knew and loved, Caitlin and her co-workers formed a union. They wanted to revive a wayward company, make your company better. But you vilify Caitlin and her colleagues for caring. You demonize them for participating in their fundamental right to organize. And worse, you and your company set out to punish Caitlin and her colleagues, withholding benefits and raises, cutting hours, and purposefully understaffing to harm their most dedicated partners. So when you give us 10 pages of testimony extolling the benefits that Starbucks offers its employees, that's not what I see. I see Caitlin. I see you squeezing the people who have made you rich with blatant disregard for the law, perhaps because you think if you can hire the lawyers and pay the union-busting consulting firms, you can get away with violating other people's rights, with disregarding their dignity, and with silencing working people in America. But here's the thing. If you can pay the lawyers and the consultants and the PR specialists, you can also pay the workers a fair wage. So you say that your father was unfairly fired after he was injured on the job. Your father had no rights, and your family paid the price. That is how your workers now feel. They have no rights. They don't want to be like your father, who had no rights. They don't want their families to have to pay the price for their children the way your father had to pay a price mm. for his children. Mm. They want rights. Mm. Your father couldn't protect himself. That's all your workers are looking for. Mm. So they can protect themselves and their family so that what happened to your family does not happen to their family. Mm. I don't think you understand that, Mr. Schultz. They're just looking to be mm. someone who can protect themselves mm. in a way your father could not. So, Mr. Schultz, I would just hope that you would understand that. But I'm afraid you don't. I'm afraid that if you step down as CEO, that you don't understand that these people are afraid that your company will lose its way again, mm. and that they need rights that don't just come from you, but come from the company. That's what they're looking for. Mm. It lost its way, you say you're back, mm. but it could lose its way again. Workers should not be dependent upon you, Mr. Schultz, in your sense of right and wrong. They should be able to have laws, protections, unions mm -hmm. that stand up for them every single day of the year. And that is something I think, Mr. Schultz, that you just fundamentally don't understand. These workers are just like your father, mm -hmm. and they have no rights. Can I respond, sir? 30 seconds. Only 30 seconds. I need more time for that. Well, I'm sorry, that's you all. Bring up my Every member here is. Bring up my father. You don't understand, sir. My father was a World War II veteran. 
fought for this country in the South Pacific. You don't understand. I understand yeah, completely. Let, let me, Your me, father yeah. was... Can I finish, sir? Yes, sure. Yeah. Your father served our country yeah. and then a, the company he yeah. worked for. Can I respond, Chairman? Yes, please. Okay. I don't understand. Let me ask you a question, since you cited the union as the answer. Is there a union contract that you personally are aware of that provides comprehensive health insurance, equity in the form of stock option, free college tuition? Is there, at $17.50 and an average of $27 with benefits, are you aware of a co union contract? Sir, answer the question. Of a, of a union contract that has those benefits, sir? Mr. Schultz. Are you aware? Mr. Schultz, here's your testimony. Looking no, back, you looking back, oh, it Mr. Is, Mr. Looking back, it is clear question? to prior to my return last April, the company had lost its way. That it question. had fallen under the dangerous I, influence I, of Wall I Street short termism like at, that I had always tried I to. I asked you a question, sir. <laughs> sir. You don't understand. Your testimony says that your own company yeah. lost its way, and it will lose its way again unless there's a okay. union in, there in a, to make Senator it Senator Hassan, thank you. In Senator in Hassan. post-COVID environment. Many, many companies. Right. Mr. Schultz, tremendous Mr. Difficulty. Schultz, Senator Hassan, please. You don't understand. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you for holding this hearing today to discuss reports of illegal union busting at Starbucks locations across the country. So in New England alone, there are 19 unionized Starbucks stores, and a total of eight unfair labor practice violations have been filed by the workers' union. So. It is absolutely critical that we hold companies accountable when they fail to comply with federal labor law. Mr. Schultz, I am seriously concerned by reports that Starbucks is coercing and retaliating against workers for exercising their rights to organize. For example, by unjustly firing workers who are involved in union organizing, conducting surveillance of union organizers, and reducing their work hours. Until two weeks ago, you were the CEO of Starbucks, and you continue to be a member of the board of directors as well as a major shareholder. So uh, what I want to know is this. I know that Senator Casey asked you about reports that Starbucks was surveilling workers who were engaged in organizing. Uh, did, do you have any knowledge that such surveillance took place? I had no knowledge of that, sir. Who decided to move these workers to other locations, the workers who were engaged in organizing, or to reduce their hours or fire them? I'm unaware of that. So you had no participation in um, decisions about moving workers who were engaged in organizing? I had no involvement in any specific issue that regards a union in a district or a store, no. Were you or your successor involved in any of these decisions? I'm no. just asking again. No. No. Mr. Schultz, the National Labor, uh, National Labor Relations Board has filed over 80 complaints against Starbucks for this kind of activity that I just asked you about. Starbucks leadership really needs to end these practices. You've said you don't know anything about them. Uh, you've also, as you discussed with Senator Markey, uh, indicated in the past that you came back because you felt the, the company had lost its way. So I will just add my... Um, my concern about these reports of these activities and urge you as a board member uh, to take action to make sure that the rights of workers who are engaged in organizing activity are protected. Now, as you know, the National Labor Relations Act requires an employer to bargain collectively with its employees' union representatives. It has been more than 450 days since the first Starbucks union was established Yet there has been little evidence of good faith negotiations between Starbucks and its union. The delay is truly unacceptable. As CEO of Starbucks, what exactly did you do to move union neg negotiations along in a timely way? We said consistently, Senator, that we are prepared to have, a, to have collective bargaining sessions when, when they are face to face, and we are ready, willing, and able. Well, the record to date is unacceptable, 450 days. Um, what will you do as someone who continues to serve on the company's board of directors to remedy the situation? We, we, want, to have, we want to have these meetings. We've scheduled 85. We, we, we've been to 85. We've tried to schedule, schedule 365. 
and we're ready to do that. And my understanding is that um, on multiple occasions after you schedule them, the company cancels them at the last minute. And I would suggest to you that that is not acceptable. Um, the facts really do speak for themselves on this issue. Starbucks is an outlier here. So you need to quickly shift course and negotiate with your unionized workers. Um, Earlier this month, this committee heard from labor leaders about employers across the country who partner with unions to achieve better outcomes for their companies and the economy. For example, the president of the Teamsters spoke about how they've partnered with United Airlines to build out an apprenticeship program that would create a thousand good paying middle class jobs. Knowing that other large companies successfully collaborate with unions, why has Starbucks not done more to collaborate with its workers unions? I don't think that's true. Well, failing to reach a contract over 450, this time period between requests to organize and getting contracts done indicates that you are resisting unionization as opposed to um, working with the union and then collaborating with it. Senator, we respect the right of every person who wears a green apron if they want to join a union, but we also have the right to communicate to the 99%, 350,000 people who want a direct relationship with the company. So my question is, why not work with the union and collaborate? And why not get the input from the unions to actually improve things for workers? Well, we've, we've, we've sat down 85 times to have those meetings, and we hope to have some more. So again, I will just urge you, there are lots of examples of large employers who work well with their unions, and they actually find that their business does better when they uh, negotiate with unions, reach contracts, and collaborate with those unions. So I would urge you uh, to uh, take that approach. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Schultz, thank you for, for being here today. I have a, a series of questions. Some of them are yes or no's, and I hope to be able to cover a lot of ground here uh, if it's possible. Uh, Mr. Schultz, yes or no, does Starbucks provide employees with generous benefits like health care, paid parental leave, and college scholarships? Yes. And you're proud that Starbucks does that? Very proud. I understand that part-time employees need to work at least 240 hours over the course of three consecutive months or roughly 20 hours a week to be eligible for those benefits. Is that true? I'm not sure that's correct, sir. I, I'd have to get back to you. I don't think that's correct. I don't want to ask one of your lawyers. Um, I believe that to be true. Okay. Um, um, I see a lot of head nodding from employees okay. behind you. Uh, but nonetheless, we can, I can submit a question to the record so that you can definitively say yes or no to that. Um, Mr. Schultz, what happens if workers' hours fall below uh, a threshold, as I suggested? Um, are you able to answer that question to their benefits? Uh, I think they're their benefits would be in question and the manager would try and get their schedule up so they don't lose their benefits. So I understand that Starbucks has a widespread pattern of reducing worker hours in stores that have unionized. Um, after conversations with constituents from New Mexico, um, that's what I've learned. Um, and why does Starbucks reduce workers' hours at unionized stores? I'm not aware we do that, sir. No, no, they won't believe Mr. Schultz, you announced in May 20. 22 that the company would raise pay and double training hours at its more than 10,000 corporate owned stores but you said that these changes and others would not apply to unionized stores or stores where workers had filed for union elections. Mr. Schultz, yes or no, did you say this? Uh, yes, my understanding was that we were not allowed under the law to provide benefits unilaterally to stores and partners that were involved in unions. Was there a, a finding at the NP, at uh, NLRB along these lines as well? I'm unaware of that. Related to that statement? I, I, I'm unaware of that. And yes or no, do you claim that Starbucks cannot make changes to benefits without good faith collective bargaining? That is my understanding. The National Labor Relations Board requires an employer and the union to bargain in good faith about wages, hours, and other terms of employment until they agree on a labor contract, not after. Are, are you familiar with that? Yes. And yes or no, just so that I understand correctly, is it true that Starbucks can hold shareholder meetings virtually, but it refuses to allow some union members to join bargaining negotiations virtually, even if other members are present? That's correct. 
The reason that I ask the question about the reduction in hours, Mr. Schultz, is I certainly commend and appreciate what uh, decisions were made about respecting employees, about valuing employees as well. What concerns me is practices that have been shared with me where a reduction in hours, where an employee maybe once worked full time, 36 hours or so, um, but then hours were changed at that property for whatever reasons. I'll suggest that I believe it's because of unionization um, and look forward to getting your response there. Um, but then the employees, I'm told, have to be on call or made available if Starbucks decides to add a shift or something. Is that true? Sir, I, I'm unaware of a specific store or situation in New Mexico. I'm sorry. I'm not asking about a specific store. Yeah. Starbucks across the country um, in many properties has reduced hours of employees. That's a fact. Is that correct? For union workers? For anyone. They've reduced we, hours. We adjust the schedule based on our business. When someone's hours are reduced, if it's for business, does Starbucks have a policy where that employee has to make themselves available if Starbucks decides to call them back in for a shift that they're not scheduled for? Uh, Your not, head nod indicates a yes. I believe the answer well, to be let yes. Me, let me try and answer that. The, the manager and the assistant manager works very closely with the people in the store to adjust hours to accommodate people's work-life balance as much as we possibly can. Okay, well, that's not my understanding. I'd be happy to submit something into the record. Okay. My concern is this. If, if a store changes its hours, reduces its open hours, staff's schedules are changed, they're reduced from 36 hours to a 20 hours, but they're told to, they need to stay available, well, how do they get another job? <laughs> If, if they can't get another job and they're trying to go to school or do something to, 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 to broaden whatever they're doing in their lives, but then a policy is put in place that says, no, we're going to reduce your hours and you have to stay on call. So, Whether it's a manager or not, that's a Starbucks yeah. policy. I just hope with all of this, that's not a policy. <laughs> well, we'd be happy to pull you in to visit with folks from New Mexico. Um, and, uh, and review uh, some of those areas as well that I've uh, been uh, taught from, from others. So I look forward to that as well. But I hope that can be done here in all of this. With Look, th there's a lot of interest. There's cameras outside and all the rest. Mr. Schultz, this company started in a strong way with what it did with its anchor stores out in Seattle and around Washington. You know, there's the NLRB case where they got closed and... Yeah. There's allegations that they've got to open up again, or I don't know, and there's been a pill. So I don't want to get into all of that stuff. But going to what Mr. Markey said with testimony no, that we lost our way, I want to be here when the panel. I certainly hope that we can find that way back, because a lot of folks support Starbucks because the employees were treated well, and I just hope that that's something that we can work on together. But I look forward to following up with your staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Then I'm incredibly proud of the long-term track record. Mr. Chairman, if I can't speak any longer, I didn't ask a question to Mr. Schultz. I'd be happy to ask a question if you'd like a response. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, what we're going to do is we have a wonderful panel that's going to be up here in a second. Uh, I, you have not voted yet, and I have not voted yet. Mr. Chair, but yeah. just for 30, 30 seconds, can I be recognized to submit a letter into the record from the Albuquerque store without, that sent it to Mr. Schultz? I without think. objection. Let me conclude this. Um, session with Mr. Schultz in saying that we are looking at a situation where one side has all the money, has all the power, has all the consultants, can hire and fire at will. We're looking at another side where workers are making not very good wages, wages that were forced up, as I understand it, by the threat of unionization so that you now have a $15 an hour minimum wage. We're looking at a situation that Senator Lujan just mentioned. You know, we're in a lovely room here. This is one world. Out there in the real world, whether it's Seattle or Vermont or wherever it is, people are given arbitrary schedules as to when they can and cannot get to work. Sometimes they're working 20 hours a week. Sometimes they're working 30 hours a week. Hard to build a budget around that. But at the end of the day, this hearing it's not about my best-selling book. It's not about Venezuela. <laughs> and it's a good book. People should read it. But it's, <laughs> but the issue is pretty simple. Workers have a right to join a union. In hundreds of shops 
that you control, workers have voted to join a union, there is zero, zero union contracts. What I am not only asking you, I am urging you, is do not only the right thing, do what is legal, sit down. Now, you've said you're prepared to sit down face to face. Is that what I heard? Yes. Do it. Sit down in the next two weeks, come back to us and tell us, tell us the success that you've had in finally negotiating a first contract. That is my hope. And with that, do I get to say a statement? You do. Yes. And I would also say this hearing is about how we should have a neutral process by which NLRB is making not a thumb on the scale on the side of one side or the other, but in which they are attempting to have a neutral process. And this committee should be investigating the allegations that have that we have a confirmation that OIG is investigating, that there are NLRB employees who are doing precisely that. Now, we on this side of the aisle firmly defend the ability of people to unionize, and we have promoted policies much more favorable for unions, for example, Keystone XL Pipeline, and it absolutely has to do with the administration's desire to buy oil from Venezuela than from Canada. Why in the world that would be, I don't know. Uh, and employing American workers and American trade unions, why that would be, I don't know. But nonetheless, that's their call and that's not mine. Uh, but we should not, in this committee, presume that someone is guilty before we have done our own independent evaluation, particularly because it would depend upon an evaluation by NLRB, which we happen to know right now is in, under investigation for being biased. NLRB is not under investigation for anything. All right, with that. Their employees are. Mr. Their Schultz, employees thank are. you very much for being with us. Uh, we are going to recess for uh, 10 minutes, and then we're going to have a very excellent panel joining us. Thank you.